Welcome to our 13th Cornerstone lesson today. On the panel, we have Cha Bridget, Flex, Barbara, and Ashley. On orchestra, we have Ashleen, Elsie, and Shema. And Joyce will be doing our sign language. Before we start, let's bow down for a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being with us thus far. May your spirit be with us. May it guide us. May we learn. In Jesus' name, I pray and believe. Amen. So our title of our mission today is Crying Over Lunch. Achia cried as she walked to the bus stop to catch a bus for high school in the West African country of Ghana. She wasn't crying because she had to go to school. She was crying because she had to go to school without any money for lunch. Mother had given her 15 Ghanaian sedi, about one USD, just enough to pay for bus fare to school. But mother couldn't pay for her lunch, and there was no food at home to share. Achia cried as she boarded the bus. She cried as she sat in her seat. She cried because she couldn't do anything else. But then she remembered God. While she couldn't do anything, God could do everything. After all, Jesus said, with, all thing, with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, verse 26. As the bus bumped down the road, Achia tearfully prayed. I know you can do anything, she prayed. So please give me some money on the way to school. Achia wondered how God might give her some money. Perhaps the bus driver would forget to collect her fare when he came up to the back to ask passengers to pay up. God, if it is possible, please make the driver forget to collect the money from me, she prayed. But something else happened. An old man with gray hair boarded the bus. Only one bus seat was empty, and it was right beside Achia. The man sat down beside Achia. How are you feeling? he asked. Achia was crying too hard to answer. Then the driver came back to collect bus fares. When the driver reached Achia, the old man pulled out 50 CD, about 3.50 USD, and paid both his and Achia's fares. He gave the rest of the money, 20 CD, to Achia. Achia tried to stop crying to thank him. But before she knew it, the old man stood up and got off the bus. Achia followed him out onto the street. She wanted to thank him. The bus had stopped only a 30-minute walk from the school, and she could walk the rest of the way. But when Achia looked for the old man, she couldn't see him anywhere. He had disappeared. Then it started to rain heavily. The bus was gone, and Achia would get soaked if she would walk to school in the rain. She thought about healing a taxi, but there were no taxis in sight. As she wondered what to do, a car stopped and its driver offered her a ride. In Ghana, some drivers earn extra money by giving rides to people. Achia gave the school's address, and the driver took her straight there. When they arrived, the driver surprised Achia. He didn't ask her to pay for the ride. Instead, he gave her 50 CD. Achia didn't understand why he had given her the money. She only knew one thing. She had left home with 15 CD, but had arrived to school with 85 CD. As she traveled to school, God had given her nearly six times more money than she had had at the beginning. Achia believes God can truly do anything for those who ask with faith. I asked him with faith on my way to school, and he did it, she said. I got more than I even asked for. Indeed, the Bible says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3 verse 20. At school that day, Achia bought herself lunch of rice and tomato stew. It tasted really, really good. Today, Achia is studying to become a nurse at a college that will receive part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. Thank you for giving a generous offering today to help more students study at the Seventh-day Adventist Nursing and Midwifery Training College in Ghana. The offering also will help another mission project, a bilingual elementary school where children will learn in French and English in Cameroon.
thank you so much for that beautiful piece of music, Faith of Our Fathers. And indeed, the topic for today is the fathers God chose for his son. I'd just like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you, to you, our viewers, from wherever you are. And I'd like to encourage you to turn to Lesson 13 of the Cornerstone Connection Lesson so that you can study along with us. Before we begin, I have a beautiful team in front uh, right here with me. I'd like each one of them to introduce themselves, starting from my immediate right. Hello, dear viewers. My name is Mikael Flex. Hello, everyone. My name is Barbara Cheng. And hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Silas. Welcome to the Cornerstone Lesson once again. Amen. And my name is Bridget. I'll be your moderator. So I'd like to invite Ashley to open for us with a prayer. Let us pray. Redeemer of the universe, we come before the throne of mercy. We ask, Lord, that as we read your word, you may give us understanding, that you may remove every preconceived idea, that your word may impart light and knowledge and wisdom to our lives, that we may be drawn closer to thee as we lift you up. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Ashley. So we have come to our last lesson for this year and, of course, for the quarter. So as I had mentioned, the title for this lesson is The Fathers God Chose for His Son. And even as we continue studying, we'll see the mothers as well, right? And so I think of importance today is for us to realize that in the previous lessons, we have been studying about the kings of Israel. And our last lesson was actually about King David. So you may wonder how we did transition from the story of King David. And now we are talking about the fathers of, of God's son, who is Jesus Christ. And that's important for us to realize that David himself is one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. Now, even as we get into our lesson today, I'd like for us to find out what do we think about this lesson. So I'd invite Barbara to take us through that. Uh, thank you so much, Sister Bridget. So I will be taking us to the what do you think session of the story, lesson 13. So for our first question, it says, you have the names of three siblings between a, between, born between 1884 and 1887, and you need to know the names of their parents, which will be the best census to start with. Is it the 1880, the 1900, or 1910? Um, Asha, Ashley? Names of three siblings born between 1884 and 1887, knowing the names of their parents, which census would be the best to start with? I think 1880 would be the best to start with. I really don't know. Uh, okay, that is a good try. What about you, Tisha Bridget? I think I'd say 1900. Um, because you realize that in 1880, these children were not yet born. So you may not be able to actually connect them with their okay. parents. So you have to at least go slightly after when they were born to actually make that connection. Yeah, that is actually correct. Uh, so moving on to the second question of the what do you think session. Uh, the best place to start your genealogical research is, is it the internet? Uh, grammar or library? library. <laughs> um, well, you know, the internet has it's so fascinating. There's actually a way where you can try to descend your genealogy, uh, but, you know, a library doesn't have your personal information of your genealogy unless you're like super famous. <laughs> uh, so the best option would be your grandma, which will tell a lot of stories. So if you have a time, go with some cup of tea. And you'll know. Mm. May I just um, add something? That don't you think our grandparents are quite intelligent? That they remembered so many names, and yet in this day, you'd just be told someone's name, and five okay. minutes later, you don't even remember. Them. Like, yeah. yeah, that would be a challenge to one each one of us here, and even the viewers listening. Mm. How far in your genealogy can you go? Yeah, that is actually correct, Flex. So moving on to the last question. You found several records that give your ancestors birth dates. Which source is the most reliable? Is it the 1834 baptismal records, 
1850 census or the 1902 death records? I think 1902 death records. Why would you say so? Because the death record, um, the, the, a death certificate is issued for burial and all the other things, maybe inheritance of land, succession of property, so that would be the most reliable because everyone needs that death certificate to move on with their lives. Yeah, um, baptismal record. Not everyone was baptized. The census. Where would you get the information? Government is difficult. Really long list. Yeah, yeah, that is actually quite true. So I can connect the what do you think session of this part with the uh, Saturday, where I will just ask a question, um, which is uh, numerous genealogies are listed in both the Old and the New Testament. Why do you think that the writers of the Bible are so careful to include this list, and what can we learn from them? Well, first of all, I think why they were so careful to include this is because uh, God promised that Abraham's, we, Abraham's generation will be among the stars, the numbers, and all that. His nation will be great. Also, David, he said that I will, through you, I will produce uh, an heir or something like that. Like, the promises of God had to be followed through some kind of genealogy, right? So they were careful to show us that what God said about his promises back then is actually true. What we can learn about it is we can be keen enough to take note of whatever is going on in our lives, maybe to help the future generation uh, learn from us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for taking us through that um, very interesting activity. So I'd like us to go right um, into the story. And a disclaimer is that our Into the Story today has a lot of names. Um, personally, sometimes I do struggle reading Bible passages that have a lot of names, which honestly at some, sometimes don't make sense to me because I don't know those people. But today, I hope you can be able to follow through with us because you'll realize that there are some people you will actually recognize in these names. Mm -hmm. So into the story, uh, it starts with, I will be his father and he will be my son. This week's, we are reading from Second Samuel 7. Chapter 7, verse 14, also from Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1 to 6, also from Luke, chapter 3, from 23, 32, and 38. So please bear along. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When does he, when does, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amnidab, Aminadab, yeah. and Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, who was the son of Elsi, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Semain, 
the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kozam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, who is the son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Mathad, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of El Eliakim, the son of Melea, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the, the son, son of, of God. God. Now, forgive me for butchering some of those names. Most of the time, if I'm being honest, I, I skip through all this. But from this, I have a few questions from out of the story. Uh, why do you think God tells David that he will be a father to his son and will punish him when he does wrong? Do you think this was more of a promise or a threat? I think to David it was comforting. That even though I die, God is there, will always be, has always been. And to my sons, because he promises to give, um, he promises to give um, David a house, a dynasty, mm. yeah? So even though he will not be there to lead his own children in the way of the Lord, the Lord has promised that I will be there and I will lead your children. I will be their father and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him. Okay, I think the, the, the part that says with floggings inflicted by human hands was a bit scary because David himself would choose to fall in the hands of God rather than the hands of men. But... The, 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 and the word I would like to underline here is when he does wrong, he may, he may not do wrong. Mm. Only when he does wrong will I punish him. Mm. Yeah. And maybe let me just add that to me it's a promise of love. Mm -hmm. There are some verses that are given there and um, if you read them you actually realize that we are told that the Lord chastens or he reprimands those, those he loves. loves. Yeah. And even just taking us back to lessons that we did a few Sabbaths ago, which was Ellie's bad, bad boys. Remember that Ellie claimed to love his sons, yet he didn't correct them. And you saw that their end was damnation. They eventually died and they were killed. And so God doesn't want us to die. He wants to separate, you know, he wants us to separate the sin from ourselves. Or he wants us to be separated from the sin. Such that at the end, when destruction is coming, we are not separate, we are not killed with that sin. So it's a promise of love to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your your comments and your answers. Now maybe the last question from out of the story: How does the knowledge that God loves you too much to allow you to continue to do wrong and harm your relationship with Him, others, and yourself give you hope as you face life's difficulties? Maybe Barbara can try that one. Uh, so the knowledge that God loves me too much and doesn't want me to continue doing wrong to harm my relationship with him actually gives me comfort. And yeah, I think I really like the way God loves me. Even though I am a sinner, I can't say I am clean because time and time again I will sin and still go back to him and he'll forgive me. True. Also for me, I... It's really a comforting thing because when we were kids, we were all beaten, I hope so, by our parents. <laughs> yeah. And in the moment, we never liked it. In fact, my mother had a habit of beating me and then hugging me and telling me she loves me. In the moment, <laughs> I couldn't see it. But thankfully, when you grow older, you actually see, hey, by the way, I needed to be beaten. And I thank my mom for doing this. So it shows that God's love is so pure and so true that he will not leave you to be in mud or sin that you will chase in you so that when you keep, when you're continuing in the life's journey, you can be purified and actually claim his righteousness. I once read a quote or someone said that gold is not purified by washing with water. It is purified by fire. So sometimes the chastement may not be enjoyable. 
it may be very very painful you can imagine being burnt it may be very painful it is burnt in a crucible not even by a burnt and banner in a crucible <laughs> so the chastisement may be painful but what comes out of the fire job says that when he tries me i shall come forth as gold because my foot hath kept his steps his ways have i kept and not declined mm. yeah so moving on to the flashlight we'll read and it says the pharisees had gathered close about jesus as he answered the question of the scribe now turning he puts a question a question to them what think ye of the christ whose son is he this question was designed to test the belief of the their belief concerning the messiah to show whether they regarded him simply as a man or as the son of god a chorus of voices answered the son of david this was the title which prophecy had given of the messiah so here we when we talk about christ and the question was what think you of christ if we read the desire of ages we figured out that the israelites every, their lives their day-to-day -day lives were pointed to the coming of the messiah mm -hmm. but because of their apostasy they drifted far away from christ that they cling to the forms of sacrifice to the dead forms and forgot who the sacrifice is pointed to so even when the son of man came to earth john 1 says that he came to his own and his own knew him not so we see that the question is for us today and the identity of christ is questioned even in our church today whether he is the son of god or whether he is not the son of god and i ask that we all should believe not about what people say, but who do we think after we have studied, who do we think the Son of God is? Mm. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much for that. So I just want to take us back um, to our story again. And for us being Christians and having studied, or even in school, having learned about the story of Jesus and his life, if you were to write a book about Jesus, mm. what title would you give it? Maybe, maybe I can start. So I thought about this and I said maybe it would be something like the mystery revealed, something like that. Um, so does any one of you maybe have any title that you may have given a book um, written about Jesus? About like his day-to-day -day life? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Anyone, Ashley or Barbara? Um, I think... Mm -hmm if I were to write a book about Jesus mm -hmm. and to give the book a title, mm -hmm. I'll give it the title that Jesus is the son of God mm -hmm. and he loves you. Yeah. Wow, that's that's okay. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Maybe for me, I'll have doubt finally resolved. Ooh, okay. Now for me, the, why I chose that is because People always say, in fact, I knew someone, I know someone who said, if only they wrote a bit more of what Jesus did yeah. for the 30 years he was, <laughs> because the Bible only talks about the, thir the three years yeah. he was in ministry. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I would have seen more or I would have believed more. Yeah. So people have a lot of doubt, especially for the 30 years, you know, what was Jesus doing and all that. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's the doubt will be finally resolved. Yeah. But there's a quote I read or is it a quote or a Bible verse, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. where it says that if we wrote the day-to-day -day activities that Jesus did throughout his life, it will fill up all the libraries <laughs> in the world. So that doubt will mm. be truly resolved, yeah. but the information will be too much. Yes, thank you so much. The reason I was asking that is because you realize how Matthew is starting the book of Matthew. It's not an interesting way. You know, he starts, it's not something that you'd actually would catch your eye and be like, I want to study this. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to realize there's a reason why he started the book that way. And there's a reason why all those verses, about 17 verses, have been given over to actually just letting us know who was in the genealogy of Jesus. And they lead back to God. And they lead back, back to, to God. God. Back yes, to so him. even though, even if we deny, okay, I don't personally, but even though that there is a lot of discussion and debate as to whether Christ is the Son of God and how was he man 
fully man and fully God, the gene genealogy goes back to God. Mm. So whether he was born man or whether he is divine, he is still the son of God. Thank you so much. Another interesting thing from our lesson is that we have seen there are females who are mentioned in this genealogy of Jesus. So what are some of the names of the females in this story? And is there anything that you could associate them with? Um, and then maybe now relate that with it being in the genealogy of Christ. Okay, maybe I'd start, I'd start with the most uncommon, yes. that is Tamar. Tamar, yes. Tamar was... Tamar was the daughter-in-law to Judah. Yes. And when I read the story the first time, I was like, no, wait a minute. How, how is this even worthy of being recorded? <laughs> it's an unrated candle. <laughs> yes, like, this is beyond, like, we cannot believe it. Mm. He was the daughter-in-law. She disguised herself as a prostitute, mm. you know. But in the end, She's forgiven. Her children are found in the genealogy of Christ. Mm. This shows that no matter, no matter how far you walk, no matter how far from God you have trod, mm. you can still come back and be a part of his family. Mm. And her name is recorded in the genealogy of Christ. That mm. gives people a lot of hope. Amen. Thank you so much for that. So that was Tamar. Any other female that maybe you saw in this genealogy? And any anything you know about them? Uh, maybe Ruth. Mm -hmm. Ruth was the. It was a story about how she left her family to go live with the the, the mother-in-law, yes. right? Or then she, yes. yeah. So Naomi. Naomi, yeah. Um, I think the reason why these women are here in this in this genealogy is to show that God really even to the minute details, he really uh, plans for it and he really wants the best outcome um, to whatever his plan is. Mm. So through these women, you can see signs of strength, courage, faith, and even a, a, a turning away from their old life mm. to accepting uh, Christ or ultimately God in their time. Mm. Um, and we can see this through the stories that are with Ruth, like she left and she was from a Moabite, right? So she left her ancestors and came to live with Naomi, who was a Jew, mm -hmm. an Israelite. Mm -hmm. And that shows that even though you turn, when you turn away to God, he will prosper you and he will use you to the best and your true success. Amen. And just to add that Ruth, um, as you said, she was a Moabite. If you remember the, where the Moabites originated from, remember they were as a result of an incestuous yes, incest relationship, relationship between Lot and his one daughter. of his daughters, right? Yeah. So it's important for us to realize that already these were a cast people. Because remember after that, they were told that you, they were actually cast by God. And they were told that they should not even, um, none of them should enter the assembly of the Lord till the 10th yeah. generation. So that it was such a big, big cast, deal. Yes. And yet God is still choosing to use Ruth as one of the people who was in the genealogy of, of Jesus. Um, maybe let me also mention about Rahab, which we also studied um, al during this quarter. Was it this quarter or somewhere during the year? And remember how Rahab, remember the story of Rahab? First of all, she was a harlot. A Canaanite. A Canaanite, yeah. exactly. She had everything that you just wouldn't want to be associated with. Yeah, and living in the, in the seat of idolatry, which was Jericho. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, so you can see God still decided to use her to be part of the genealogy. And it just shows us that truly God does not discriminate. He is not a, a someone who favors people, yes? So it's important for us to realize that they did purposefully mention these females for us to actually see that God can use anybody. And even for you, our dear viewer, it doesn't matter maybe how low you've fallen, as long as you come back to God with a contrite heart and let him know that truly, Lord, I am sorry, and you completely turn away from it, then he can use you in whatever work that he has planned for you. Mm -hmm. All right. So maybe we can move on to our Wednesday section. All right. So the Wednesday section has a number of verses in the punchline. And it asks us to read these passages and how it relates or answers the question which Jesus poses in Luke 
chapter 20, verse 41. If someone has it, they can read it. So Luke chapter 20, verse 41, it says, mm-hmm. Then Jesus said to them, Why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? Yes, so now, um, as you guys are thinking, I can maybe say a verse which I think answers the question that, that Jesus poses in Luke chapter 20, verse 41. And I'll start with, oh, there's no verse. Okay, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now we see that the question was practically answered by the angel of the Lord. He called Joseph the son of David. So there's no, um, there should be no debate, debate about <laughs> it. You know, if it wasn't even posed by a man, it was a direct, yeah. Himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, how's the verse? Yeah, the verse I'd like is Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6, which says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, by, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Mm-hmm. I like the KJV version, though. Because he was chastened for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. Look at the ladies who are mentioned in his genealogy. All of them, every one of them, had either a hereditary sin that was not part of her life, or some of them did mistakes in their own lives, which are not regarded as a small sin in our today's world, in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> So I'd like us to all know that no matter what we do, look at David. David was the man after God's own heart, yet there are things he did that he repented of. He wished that I might as well die than than live through the consequences of the things I have done. But still, God calls him a man after his own heart. So I'd like to pose this to the viewers, a question. And my question would be, what is it that you have done that makes you feel undermined, makes you feel so unworthy of God's love? Even though, yes, you're unworthy by birth, but there are things in your life that you have done, that you have come across, temptations that you have fallen, and you feel like, the Lord should not look at me. I do not want to be seen by God. I'd rather run away from his presence. Mm -hmm. And know that no matter how you feel, God still cares about you, and he's still willing that you do not perish, but that you come to everlasting life. Amen. Thank you so much for that. So I'd like to invite Barbara to take us through our key text, which is from Luke chapter 3, verse 23 and verse 31. So our key text for today says, Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of David. So maybe you can connect it also with the Monday Monday part. part. Yes. Yeah, so the Monday part, the question states, Explain why Luke said, so it was thought, that Jesus was the son of Joseph and David. Does the inclusion of this statement cast doubt on the divine origin of Jesus? Why or why not? I don't think it casts doubt. I think Matthew just realized that people weren't spiritually discerned Mm -hmm. at the time because, you know, the scriptures were there, right? And the synagogues were there. And everything was there for them to be revealed through the Holy Spirit that truly this is the Messiah who ultimately is a descendant of of David. And so it's not really a cast of doubt. I think it's just for the times he was in, so it was thought, Mm. because no one really was spiritually discerned. All they knew was this is Joseph's child. But Matthew was revealed that this is not, he is the son of Joseph, but he's also ultimately the descendant of David. David. 
Okay, so even as we proceed, before we come to an end, maybe let's hear what does the spirit of prophecy have to say about um, our lesson today? Well, our lesson today has very many stories in one. It has the reign of David intersected with the coming of Christ, the chosen people, the unpreparedness, and even the fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ. Yeah. Concerning the... Um, when, when, when God decided to give David a dynasty and he was not allowed to build the temple, I'd like us to learn one lesson. But sometimes our definition of success may be doing something for God or doing more than God requires, even though he has not commanded, we want to do it out of gratitude. It may not be his will for us to do it. But if you cannot have what you hoped for, do not sit in despair and allow all your energy to go to waste, but arise, guard yourself, and help others to achieve. If you may not build, you may gather materials for him that shall, and if you may not go down the mines, you may hold the ropes. So I'd like us to understand and know, even as we close, that We may not be able to achieve the things we want to achieve, but we can lay stone for those who are coming after us, those who God has prepared to do the work that was in our hearts to do, so that we are not blinded by the fact that I was not able to achieve this, and therefore all the rest of the things that we have to do in this life become unimportant or restrained. Um, other than that, I'd like us to also remember that we are at the risk of interpreting prophecy or God's promises for our own selfish desires. Because we want a breakthrough in something, we may interpret it to give us the meaning that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. But we are called upon to be submissive to the Spirit of God, that He may influence our minds even as we read His Word, that we may be able to submit to his will for our lives, even though that is not what we want for ourselves. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much for that point. Maybe I can add something that just came to me mm -hmm. to still answer about the divine origin of Jesus. Mm. I mean, even just from the, from the title, the father God chose for his son. Mm. I mean, that right there is just divine in itself because we can see that the plans for salvation was way before we even fell. Yeah. This was... Um, it says that Jesus was the lamb from the foundation, of slaughtered the of the world, something like that, right? Yeah. So we can see God actually thought out even to the minute details of the genealogies, who will be the fathers, the descendants, the mothers, and he used everyone who actually accepted or turned from their wickedness and came to his light. Mm. And why I'm saying this is because um, as, as much as he did this for his son and his descendant, as we can see, was planned from the very beginning, we can tell that, I can tell you for a fact that God has a plan for your life. Amen. And he has planned it. You know, nothing can surprise God. Nothing. You know what? You know that thing where you're told a secret and like, oh, for real, like, <laughs> this happened. Yeah. Who, who can surprise God? Yeah. Um, there's a song that says, who can give counsel to the all-knowing? Yeah. You know, what do we know that can actually benefit God? So as you're going through your life, just know that God has your back. You just need to trust him and follow out his will and his promises, and you will be truly safeguarded. Amen. Amen. And we have come to the end of our lesson today. I'd like to thank so much my panelists for having this discussion with us. And I'd like to invite you, dear viewer, for our next lesson. So before we finish, I'd like to invite Barbara to close for us in prayer. Just before we pray, I'd like us to read the further insight. Mm -hmm. It says, in the fields where the boy David had led his flock, shepherds were still keeping watch by night. Through the silent hours, they talked together of the promised Savior and prayed for the coming of the King David's throne. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So at the time when we think it not, at the time when we are in our thoughts and doing our own things, these are the moments when 
God impresses many things upon our minds, so we may only learn to meditate and listen to his voice. Amen. Barbara, you can pray for us. Okay, so let us close with a word of prayer. Kind and ever living God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to come and record our 13th lesson and our last lesson for this quarter, oh dear Lord. Dear Father, even as we disperse, please be with us, guide us and protect us and help the viewers online to understand what we have just discussed here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.